This is really um, a good lecture because I, ha I must tell you that I have had to collect these slides. Um, I haven't talked on the pathology of coronary artery disease for quite some years. It was a very hot topic many years ago. There was silence and now it's coming back. This is exciting. So it's good to see that there's still interest. I want to start with this slide and I, I'm sure that many, if not all of you, have seen this a publication in The Lancet some years ago. So we understand that obviously atherosclerosis dates back more than 4,000 years, and this is the first description um, in um, the earliest cases of coronary artery disease found in Egyptian princes. Um, she was the f of obviously the first person where atherosclerosis was detected, and you can see in these CT scans that she obviously suffered from severe calcification in her left um, and anterior descending artery. So, and also the RCA, you can see this is something that we get used to with CT being more prominent in our field these days. Then the first person who coined the term angina pectoris was William Herberton. He was a British physician. He was uh, graduating from Cambridge and he was the person who really described the shortness of breath and the discomfort in the chest for the first time so much because we are in a very traditional place. I think it's good to understand this. So several thousand years after these ancient histories, I was very privileged to work with this person that I'm showing here. And most of the stuff I know today is based on uh, my uh, co-workers uh, um, co there at CV Path Institute, Reno Romani. Uh, I was able to learn about pathology of coronary artery disease. And many years later, I was uh, working with the ESC textbook, and we came up with this cartoon to make it simple for everyone. And you can see how plaque rupture occurs, how it builds up the cholesterol in the artery, how the cap is th thinning over time, and then finally rupturing um, to cause luminal thrombosis, and in most cases, either sudden death or acute myocardial infarction. So we as physicians, most often get confronted with the end stage of diseases, and that's a pity. And that's what I want to show you here. This is an ulcerated plug of a patient that suffered myocardial infarction, but you can see that this aorta is full of eroded, ruptured, call it whatever you want to, plugs. And I think it's interesting to see this with the eyes of a pathologist to see how it really looks when these plug ruptures. But where does it all begin? And this is something that I had to learn also. This is a longitudinal section um, where you can look at the left main coronary artery. And you can see that it really starts at sites of low shear stress. That means the carina of a bifurcation is almost always spared from atherosclerotic disease. And you can see that the plaque is forming at the low shear stress sites, at the LAD portion and the circumflex portion of this artery. And this is the same for carotid artery specimens that is shown on the left panel of this slide. So many years later, that was actually in 1995, that's when I graduated from high school, interesting to know. Um, Sterry came up with a classification in the American Heart Association, uh, classifying types of lesions, starting from early lesions to type 6 lesions. Those are the ones that show rupture or fissure or erosion. The problem with this classification was that it was not granular enough. It didn't really provide enough information on what are the risky lesions on, also on the underlying pathophysiology. And this is why several years later, five years later, actually in the year 2000, um, Reno Romani and her group came up with a new definition that was published in ATVB by the time. And you can see the editorial was written by Sterry. And it's interesting. You can still read it up. It's very interesting to read it. And now this time, the classification that most of you have seen for some, um, in some instances probably starting from intimal thickening all the way to thin cap fibroatheroma was born and was um, termed uh, with this new um, um, HA classification. Now let's look at these lesions just so that we get a better understanding for you know, what we do with our drug coated balloons later on. This is an early lesion, early atherosclerosis. You can see those foamy cells, lipid pools that are seen within the intima. And what you can see already on the right panel of this slide is microcalcification. That means as soon as we see those lipid pools accumulating, we also start to see apoptosis of cells. For some reason, they don't like it, they die. And the result of these dying cells is microcalcification. And that's what we sometimes can detect 
with intravascular imaging, with CT, um, um, but this is the early sign of atherosclerosis. And then it, it took many, many years to understand that you know, this is a progressive disease. Actually, it starts with these early lesions, foamy lesions. It can regress also at this stage. But there is a certain stage in time when you have fibroatheroma where it's no longer regressive and it can only progress or um, calcify and passivate in a way. So calcification is a process, a biological process of passivation. And this is shown here. You see the progressive lesions. That's at least when pathologists believe there is no longer no regression is, is, is possible anymore at this point in time. We start with pathological intima thickening. A later stage is fibroatheroma that you know well, also from imaging studies. And then finally, we believe thin cap fibroatheroma is the precursor to what we call plaque rupture. And I'll show you that uh, in a moment. Um, again, what you know, makes these lesions progress? That's the key questions which we haven't fully understood even until today. But one of the key findings is that you know, vasa vasorum, micro vessels play an important role, neovascularization. Um, and you can see how those micro vessels sprout into the um, intima. Uh, and you can see these focal brain po uh, break points in the media. Smooth muscle cells get interrupted, and that's where those micro vessels start to sprout into the uh, intima. And that was described um, many years later. You can see different regions. They can come either from the adventitia to um, migrate and sprout into the intimal medial border, or they can also uh, be found in the pericore region once we see more progressive atherosclerotic lesions. And that was described to be um, a, a precursor of what we call intraplaque hemorrhage, because these are leaky um, vessels, and they tend to rupture and cause intraplaque hemorrhage. And that's what you're seeing here. This is an unstained section, just if you use your eye of a pathological specimen, and you can see those microvessels actually when you use light microscopy. This is specific staining, um, immunohistochemistry to really identify those microvessels, and what was shown is that um, when you look at these progressive lesions from pathological intima thickening, fibroatheroma, late stage fibroatheroma, you see an increase in these microvessels, especially in the pericore regions which then gives a lot of credit to the hypothesis that this is an important pathophysiological process of plaque progression. And this is, what, this is a summary slide, more or less, of what we know um, of, about vulnerable plaque until today. Um, we know that the fibrous cap thickness plays an important role. I won't have the time to go into detail, but these are the essential information. Necrotic core size, we know the larger the size, the more likely it is that it ruptures and the more risky it is for the patient. Macrophage infiltration, we know because those are active cells, they tend to digest the fibrous cap and cause remodeling. Um, from the old Glagov time, you already know that positive remodeling is a phenomenon that we observe in these specimens until a certain point where it's no longer able to remodel. And neovascularization, which is one of the latest findings in intraplaque hemorrhage, which plays a critical role in progression of these plaques. Um, I have told you that this is all based more or less on pathological observations, and, and I'm privileged also to have been part of this Le Duc Foundation consortium, which looked more at the molecular um, uh, investigations of what makes these you know, cells undergo a detrimental development, because we understand that some plugs have a more favorable development. They tend to calcify, um, become passive, um, while others tend to you know, become thinner and thinner and eventually are going to rupture. And we believe that smooth muscle cells play a very important dominant role in this, um, uh, in this whole pathophysiology. Now let's quickly look at those you know, lesions that give us a lot of trouble because we have to come in at the night and treat these patients. Um, lesions with thrombi, this is all based on, on work uh, with Reno Romani that we had done rupture in two thirds of the cases, you know, plaque erosion, which in this series of sudden death cases um, accounts to approximately one third of the patients and the least frequent being calcified nodule and plaque fissure, which is only rarely seen. And this has been described also in the European Heart Journal in, in, in 2013 uh, by Erwin Falk. He, he looked at his cases and he collected almost 2,000 cases. And you can see that very similar numbers were found. Two thirds of all patients died of plaque rupture. The remainder uh, were mostly uh, erosions that were seen by that time. So we do believe until today that 
thin cap fibroatheroma is a precursor of plaque rupture, um, and that's where, all, where we are starting, basically. All of our um, investigations, be it pharmacological or interventional, are based on that premise. Um, finally, erosion. I'm showing you a case here um, where you see uh, absence of endothelial cells that tends to uh, then uh, undergo um, superficial uh, er erosion with the subsequent thrombus formation. And the least frequent um, calcified nodule, however, extremely important these days because we have tools to treat these patients. But you can see how much calcium there is, how, how stiff and hard it is um, to treat these vessels once they calcified. And I want to end with this slide. Um, understanding drug-coated balloons means understanding histopathology of coronary artery disease. And that is based on the fact that we need to understand three important facts. First of all, the direct vascular effects. Second, we need to understand how drug is delivered, how much drug is delivered into the underlying tissue. And third, the downstream effects of this technology, which is not the same for each balloon technology. And we need to understand this because all the safety of, for our patients is based on, on these kind of um, factors. With that, um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and thanks for your attention. <laughs>